Hello folks, welcome back. In our last video, we assembled a jeweler's regulator that had a mercury pendulum. And I wanted to take some time and talk about mercury in clocks and how you handle that. So this is a Waterbury regulator number three. This is a 80 beat kind of mid-sized wall clock. And this one happens to have a mercury pendulum. That's not very common on this clock. Most of these had a round bob. But this one has mercury and it's set up and I have good lighting here. So I'm gonna talk about the purpose of mercury in a pendulum and how to handle it in a clock. When I show people a clock like this, they're startled by the use of mercury in a pendulum. Why was that done? Well, it was a way of improving clock accuracy by compensating for the effects of temperature change on the clock. The rate of a clock is determined primarily by the effective length of the pendulum. And that's not a simple measurement. That's not just taking a tape measure from the top to the, the bottom and calling that the length of the pendulum. Rather, it is the relative weight distribution that determines the actual rate of the pendulum. It's not about the weight either. You can have a very heavy pendulum bob and a similar pendulum that has a light pendulum bob that would have the same rate. Rather, what matters is the weight distribution along the pendulum. And interestingly, if I add weight above the center of mass on the pendulum, making it heavier, if I add that above the center of mass, I'm actually going to be raising the center of mass of the pendulum, which will mean the clock will run faster by adding weight. And conversely, I could remove weight and make the clock run slower depending upon where I did that. Pendulums are remarkably consistent devices and that makes them ideal for timekeeping. A pendulum is only as good as its materials though. Nearly every material expands when temperature rises and shrinks when temperature falls. In a clock, this means that in the summertime, a clock will run slower as the pendulum has expanded due to the temperature increase. This lengthens the pendulum, which lowers the center mass and slows the clock. Conversely, in the winter, the pendulum shrinks, which raises the center of mass, speeding up the clock. There's nothing you can do about that. It's just the nature of materials. You can, however, compensate for that. And this is where mercury comes in. Mercury, like all other materials, expands and contracts with temperature changes. A compensating mercurial pendulum like this one has jars of mercury, and the mercury rises with a temperature increase, raising the center of mass of the pendulum, which compensates for the lengthened pendulum rod, which lowers the center of mass. So we've got pendulum getting longer, but mercury rising, and then that balances out the rate of your clock as temperature changes. The main disadvantage of mercury is that it can be a health hazard, and that brings us to the main topic of our video. I've written an article on my website that goes into more detail on the science, the legal issues, and my personal preferences of having mercury in a clock. But the short version is, as long as the mercury stays in your pendulum, there's no risk. And so what I want to do for the remainder of this video is talk about how do you handle mercury safely so that you're greatly reducing the chances of having a spill. I will say that having a mercury clock is maybe not for everybody, and I totally understand the concerns over having something that's potentially hazardous in your house. I will say though that unless mercury is spilled, it's basically inert. It's not going to hurt you. In fact, it's probably not even in the top 10 list of most dangerous substances in your house. Bleach, drain cleaner, gasoline, propane tanks, any other of the household chemicals are far more likely to actually cause some kind of injury or property damage than mercury in a clock. Metallic mercury does evaporate at room temperature, but as long as there is any kind of a cover on the mercury, the health risk is virtually zero. Whatever minuscule amount of mercury vapor that may escape will be exchanged with the outside air, which already contains some amount of mercury that's just in the environment through the air leakage of your home. The greater risk of mercury exposure comes when mercury is spilled and spread over a large area. Consider a glass of water. If the water is in the glass, only the surface of the water can evaporate. All the water below the topmost layer of water is held captive by the water above it, and so it takes days or a week or more for a glass of water to evaporate. If I take the same water and I pour it out over a large area, now the surface area of water exposed to the air is many times greater, which means this same volume of water is going to evaporate quickly, probably in just a few hours. Mercury is the same. Mercury vials in a clock are tall and slender and have a very small surface area, and every mercury pendulum has at least a metal cap. Others are entirely sealed or corked. 
even with the standard metal cap, the mercury has almost no exposure to the outside environment and therefore will have almost zero evaporation. If mercury spills, however, now the surface area of the mercury is much greater and cleanup is a concern. So is mercury worth the risk? Many people feel the risks of mercury spill outweigh the historical completeness and coolness of a clock with an intact mercury pendulum. That's very understandable, and many people remove the mercury from their pendulum and replace it with steel or lead shot. And your clock's going to run just fine like this, though with less effective compensation. I would ask that if you end up with mercury that you'd rather not have, if your local laws allow it, check with your local National Watch and Clock Collectors chapter and see if you can find someone who'd like to have your mercury for their clock, rather than taking it to your local hazardous waste facility. As for someone who would like a historically complete clock, acquiring mercury is pretty challenging. If you choose to have mercury in your clock, there are three factors that I believe are important to greatly reducing your risk of an incident. The first is to anchor your clock to a wall. Often the clock has a hole in it already, and you can line that up with a stud and not have to alter your clock at all. But even if you have to do it, I believe it's critically important to prevent someone from accidentally bumping into your clock and knocking it over. One way of minimizing damage to your clock is to use a metal angle bracket mounted on the top of your clock, like I demonstrated in my setting up a jeweler's regulator video. The second thing is to keep the door locked if it has a lock, or latched at all times to keep kids and other curious people out. And the third thing is to have your clock inspected periodically to make sure that everything that's in the path of suspending the pendulum is solid. The movement mounts, the pendulum suspension spring, and any other components. Pendulum suspension springs do occasionally break, but inspecting when the clock is serviced every 10 years or so should make sure you stay ahead of any metal fatigue. So how do you transport mercury? Mercury can be transported in a passenger vehicle legally. Ironically, you're going to have a very difficult time finding any company that would be willing to transport it for you due to the hazmat requirements and due to the potential for mercury to weaken aluminum, mercury is banned from almost all airplanes because the airframe is aluminum. Mercury should always be stored or transported in plastic or glass containers, never metal, as mercury reacts with many kinds of metal, especially aluminum, which is used in cookware. Steel doesn't react with mercury, but not all steel containers are liquid tight. So here's my method of transporting mercury. Inside this steel paint can is a layer of uh, insulating packing material and then a glass jar with a screw-on plastic lid. So the packaging material that I have here is called vermiculite. This is a type of insulation that's sometimes put in uh, houses. It, it settles really nice and so it holds this uh, very well. It's easy to, you know, you put the jar in and then you can pack the vermiculite around it and this just isn't going anywhere. It's got a very low center of gravity so it's unlikely for this to tip over as long as your jar isn't full. And here is the jar of mercury. There's two layers of containment, the glass jar with the mercury in it, the metal container as well as the insulating material provides some mechanical shock absorption. And now for the fun part, actually putting the mercury back in the vials. You'll notice first of all that I'm working over a tray that has sides on it. And the reason for this is if there's any mercury spillage that hits the surface and then it just takes off running, the little beads spread everywhere. So the side walls would collect that if anything spilled. But that's not gonna happen because of some precautions that I'm gonna take. My transport jar, you'll notice, is large. So when I emptied the clock, I was able to just pour the vials in and I, I didn't have any spillage. Going the other way, though, is not a good idea. That's very dangerous to pour a very large wide mouth into such a small container. So I'm going to use this pipette. And this is just a, you know eyedropper kind of idea. So I'm going to squeeze it, which releases the air stick it in the mercury, and then let it fill up the mercury, and then I can insert it into my tube. So I'm gonna continue this until my vial is full. One other precaution I took, just because it took me a few minutes to do the transfer, was to use a fan blowing out the window just to draw any of the mercury vapor from the transfer out the window. I have another window open elsewhere in the shop, so there's nice airflow here. Doing this in a well-ventilated area is a good idea. Well, that went relatively without incident. A couple notes on that. You want to make sure that your pipette stays vertical. Otherwise, the 
surface tension can break and air bubbles can sneak in. You also want to move slow because shaking the mercury is enough to overcome the vacuum sometimes. So tipping your vial just over the edge of the jar can help with that. But anyway, we are in and uh, this is going to go in a plastic bag, which I will then take to my local hazmat facility along with um, a paper towel I use just to wipe the sides of the jars. So we're pretty well set. Uh, one other precaution that I'm going to take is using some corks. And so I bought this from a chemistry supply store and I actually cut it on my bandsaw to be the right thickness to fit in there. Um, this is such a thin piece of cork that there is actually a void in the wood. And I want to do a little better than that. Obviously, anything is better than just the, the basic metal cap, but I want to try to work a little harder. So I'm going to use some plastic wrap, just a couple layers of that around the cork. And that should give me a better seal. And all of this is just insurance on insurance. But plastic wrap doesn't cost very much, so it's worth a couple minutes of work here. And there we have our sealed vial, so off to the clock. And finally, we have our finished pendulum. I wanted to use both hands while I was putting these vials in, so forgive the lack of live shots. One note, as you're putting it in, uh, you wanna make sure that as you are lowering the, the cap, that it actually comes down on the top of the vial so that it's fully captured all the way around. That's what will hold it in place. Otherwise, there's a possibility that it could tip out and that would be a disaster. So we are at the end of this project. We'll give her a little push here and we have completed our very unique clock. Thanks for watching.